going to turn to this evening's speaker and introduce um, Victor Maldonado, who is a multi multidisciplinary artist, a freelance curator, and a writer who lives and works in Portland, Oregon. He is currently an assistant professor and inclusion specialist at the Portland Northwest College of Art. Um, Victor was born in Michoacan, Mexico, grew up in the central San Joaquin Valley in California, um, in a family of migrant field laborers. Uh, he earned his Bachelor of Fine Arts in Painting and Drawing from the California College of Art, and then an MFA in Painting and Drawing from the School of the Art Institute in Chicago. Um, their practice deploys both traditional mediums, including painting, printmaking, and drawing, alongside contemporary strategies such as performance, installations, and interventions. And, uh, we are now so happy to introduce Victor Maldonado. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you everybody so much. As you can tell, I'm not a native to Windows, so I apologize to all of you for having to watch us put the slideshow up. And I, I wanna thank you too for just taking the time out of your day to come out tonight and hear me talk about my experience as an artist because I remember being exactly where you were at a junior college in the Central Valley of California, not 20 years ago, trying to figure out my life, trying to figure out my career, trying to figure out if I could actually have, like, find a job uh, that I loved and have a career that, that would enrich me and, 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 I, and in, give me a quality of life that I think I didn't know I could have. Uh, so I just want to say, uh, you can have the quality of life you see, and you can get the kind of job that you're looking for. Better yet, I think all of you can have a career doing the kinds of things that make you feel alive, that challenge you, and that make you ask better questions of yourself and the people around you. So don't settle for a job, okay? If you're, if you're already here, chances are you're headed towards a career, not a job. And I'll tell you the difference between a job and a career. A job is something you leave when you leave the place you're working at. And a career is something that you carry all your life. Right? In Latin, the word career means the story of the obstacles you've overcome. So today I wanted to show you 15 obstacles that I've overcome. Excuse me here. Uh, how many, so all of you here are art students, right? Or taking art classes, right? Especially for you, those of you that are taking art classes that are not art students, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, I always knew I wanted to be an artist. Uh, and it took about, 18 years of telling people that to convince them that I was <clears throat> so that takes practice and I got to art school and then I met all the people actually who were artists uh, and it was pretty depressing uh, and it made me stop and it made me drop out and it made me remember how much I loved being an artist more than a college dropout so I went back to uh, art school and finished uh, and I really just became a fan of craft and I became a fan of, <clears throat> excuse me, of failure, actually, to tell you the truth. Uh, it's pretty tough being an artist uh, and a designer. <clears throat> it's pretty tough making a living. It's kind of just tough being a human. Uh, and there's a lot of failure involved in what we do even before we make anything, <clears throat> excuse me, close to art. Um, so that what I'm showing you here is actually a print that I made as a graduate student at the School of the Institute of Chicago which is a school that has a really, you know, high octane brand. It's, it's, it's the school you go to if you want to head to New York and be a big time artist. Um, but I wanted to go there because there was this wonderful multicultural, uh, inclusive set of values. Uh, it was tied to a museum. It was <clears throat> this kind of shining beacon of an art school that I thought I didn't deserve to go to. And it was kind of in the back of my mind always. Uh, and after I had navigated the uncertainty of living persistent poverty and constant marginalization because of miseducation, uh, if you grew up like me, you grew up being victimized by public school, by the policing uh, in our community, by the banking systems. Uh, so there was not very many places to go where I came from. And uh, so I turned to drawing, printmaking, and painting. And what you see here, is actually a recollection of all the years that I grew up in the Central Valley. Um, 
it, it's made to look like traditional Mexican folk art and craft, but actually it's derived from popular iconography around me. So the lowrider actually just being an exact replica of an Impala from a lowrider magazine. Uh, I didn't invent that, somebody else did that. And, uh, but I knew how to copy it through printmaking. Because uh, as an artist, one of the first things you learn how to do is be a copycat, right? Before you can do anything that's yours, you have to learn how to make the forms that came before you. That's kind of true, but you got to figure out for yourself. Because some of you actually can just do things straight out the bat, and if you can do that, just keep going. But if you're having struggles with finding your own voice and kind of telling your own story, go ahead and practice telling other people's stories first. Uh, and so for me, at this point in my life, this was back in 2005, it was really important to kind of be like, hey, I'm here. I made it, even though you all said I couldn't be here, even though you didn't give me any help. Um, even though I had to navigate so much, but certainly I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm getting my graduate degree uh, at this amazing school, um, but I still don't know where I'm going. So I put what I don't know in my work. So that car, I don't know who's driving. It wasn't me. Somebody else was making those choices. And so much of what uh, I want to show you today is just how being an artist uh, lets me be in responsible and in charge for my own choices. So again, you actually don't have to make art to be an artist, by the way. I would, I would tell you that right now, having got all the degrees. You can just call yourself an artist, and people will believe you after about 18 years. So you just got to keep at it, right? Um, and, and you can go on Instagram and call yourself an artist these days, too. You can go on social media, right? You can walk around uh, Vancouver and just tell people you're an artist. And people will be like, well, tell me more about your work, right? So I want you all, no matter if you're going to be artists or not, just start being storytellers. Because uh, it's, it's very rare, I think, that we get to hang out with each other or people that are not like us. So being an artist forces me to like people that aren't like me. I don't even like people, but it makes me like go lecture about my work to a room full of strangers I've never met before, right? And tell you things that I would never tell you if we were hanging out in a coffee shop, right? So art is always that way to do something that the social mores and ethics and laws of our time don't let us do, right? So again, you're an artist because you make things look like art, but also you're an artist because you live your values and you see the world with your own eyes, right? So that kind of makes you something really, somebody really valuable for society. Again, thinking about, do I only have to tell the story of the obstacles that I overcame? This is a flood escalade, uh, and it's actually the size of the escalade that I really desired. Uh, after getting my graduate degree, my MFA, after having multiple shows that were getting, making me a lot of money, I really felt like a success. I'd reached all these goals uh, that I'd set out to reach, and you know, any, anything that was getting in my way, I'd get over it. I was very kind of full of myself. And I think this painting really kind of captured how full of myself I was. Um, I brought in some iconography, uh, kind of mocking uh, the wars that were happening. Um, and embedding them into the painting. I was using glitter to make fun of kind of a minimalist aesthetic and painting at that time. Uh, and, and looking back, really, it's, it's embarrassing to look at this painting now. And again, I feel like oftentimes when we're practicing traditional forms of art, there's only one way to do it, and that's to do it right. That's how you know it's traditional. There's only one, one right way to do it, right? As modern artists, we, we don't have to abide to a common text. There's no Bible, there's no state. There's not even a person that we want to tell a story for, right? So we don't have to have figures in our pictures anymore. We can still tell the story, but of art now, right? So for me, I transitioned from telling the story of myself and my pain as an immigrant, as, as somebody on the other side of, of, of the target in terms of how society treats people. Um, and at this point, really, I, I, I was trying to practice writing the volatility of just being in our society when the, when the wars in Iraq were happening, where our nationalist politics were rising, where our, our, our wanting for more security was making us give more and more of our civil liberties. I wasn't even a citizen at this point, but I was fully pissed off about how many of, of the rights, that supposed rights I thought were getting taken from us. Again, I was very full of myself. And, and as you walked around this piece, actually it changes colors, and I apologize, I don't have a video for this, but again, I, this was very kind of late, 2008, bling, everything was big. And, you know, if anything, what you make today is gonna to be a wonderful archive and memento of where you are. So even if you don't make work to sell, make work to invest in yourself. Because art gives you a way to sense not just the things you wanna look at, 
but it gives you a way to come back and think about the things you didn't have time to think about in that time, right? And realizing that even though it's my freedom of expression and speech to say whatever I want, when I injure and hurt people with my work, I can apologize to them. And again, so I want you to know that having freedom of expression is a responsibility, right? And that means that you have to be open to hearing how what you say affects others. Right? And, I, and I feel like in painting, oftentimes because we're making it in private, we can be bigger than we really are, and then we put it in public and we get put back to size, right? So this painting was really all about making us feel small. For a long time, because I made work about these really dark, gothic, Mexican themes of, of mine uh, as an immigrant in the States, I, I wondered what would happen if I made work that didn't tell you any of the stories you're used to hearing? How can I tell you a story about my life and the way that I was in culture in the United States without you necessarily hearing any of those words? Uh, how could I share with you the, the all-encompassing experience of not just being a, a, you know, somebody who's growing up and learning, but being conditioned by a media society. So what you're looking at here is actually all the TVs that I grew up with. Each the scale of that TV that I grew up with placed in the space where the television would have been at my house. So I don't know how many uh, Latin Americans or Mexican Americans we have in the house, but in, when I was a kid, we had giant console television. Maybe more than Mexican people had them. So remember those old console televisions? Those are the ones on the, on the floor. Uh, the ones on the top are the little TVs that we would have in people in, in, our, in our rooms. And again, as, as, as I changed in age and in college, my TV would end up in the weirdest places little monitors, uh, and again, it was a way to, to recall my past and to see it in a way that I couldn't see it even then, right? So again, art isn't an object, y'all. It's just part of the equation, right? Art is a discipline. It's, it's a way of, of being in the world and of expressing yourself in the world. And the fact that you make things that people call art is great, because then you, they can collect them, they can live with them, they can get a sense of you, not just on, on day one when they bring the, the art that you make home, but if it's art, it'll grow with them. It'll make them grow, right? So really think about how much you're investing in the things you're making, your studies being one of them. By the way, there's no greater art than education because you're constantly being active in your environment. You're asking better questions. And for me, this gave me a way to really understand the internalized kind of hate that I had as a Mexican immigrant, kind of being asked at one moment to let go of the traditional past while not having anything like a role model or, a, a, or even a mentor to guide me in a, in a new direction, right? So I turned to TV, right? I learned actually how to speak watching Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck do their thing. Uh, I got sat down in front of the TV uh, from an early age because both my folks were working all the time. Right? So I got raised by TV, and when I got to school, everybody was talking like Daffy Duck and Donald Duck, and it was pretty scary and surreal. Uh, but again, I, I think I want you to think about what do you already expose yourself to? Are you making artwork about that? Because you should, even if, if, even if it's problematic, even if it's something you're not quite sure about. Look at the things in your life. Look at the things that help inform and motivate you, because you should be making art about them. Uh, they're having an effect on me. And I didn't realize how much an effect TV had on me until I really started to think about what is my culture? Well, I don't have a culture. It's this popular culture of United States in television that comes out of Hollywood or production sites, right? So I really began to think about how simulated our society is, how our identity is rooted not just in our physiognomy, the way that our face is made up, the cast of our skin, uh, but by our class, which is largely invisible, right? We like to mix, especially in universities, especially in public squares. We don't necessarily want to know what class we are, we just want to mix. Um, and so I really began to push my work more towards that formless or systemic or invisible thing. Um, and, and more began to ask things of my audience that I didn't really know the answer for which is how do I get you to stop and look at a painting that doesn't have an image? Like, how much do I actually have to put into the work that I'm making to get you to stop and think you're looking at art long enough to make you believe that you're looking at art so that then it does become art, 
right? So as a conceptual artist, I really was drawing on my ability as a painter to make images in space. And funny enough, if you put enough paint in front of people with glitter, they just stare. I mean, it's, we, we love to look, you know? And I think there was no one story I was trying to tell people about this, but for me, this was a parable about being an immigrant, again. Even though I was trying to let go of that content, it kept coming up, right? That after I let go of the stories, the structures remain. And I gotta tell you what, no matter how big the walls are, the people that get to the walls have kind of overcome bigger obstacles than walls to get to the wall, right? So it's not even about the wall. So what you're looking at is actually the size of the Mexican-American border, uh, that height. And it's actually, I mean, there's times where I feel like I can jump over it when I install it. It just, it, it feels very doable, right? And I think, again, if there's obstacles in your life that are getting in your way, just look at them. Just look at them without fear and you will overcome them. It's amazing, it happens every time. It's one of the scariest parts of making paintings because you have to overcome the blank canvas, right? Because it's so beautiful before you mess it up with the wrong mark, right? It's like when you get like a beautiful piece of rag paper and you're making a print, you're like, oh man, whatever I inked up on the plate better not mess this beautiful piece of paper up, right? Again, we're constantly challenging ourselves. Um, this piece was also challenging my audience to think about one thing made of many because I really started to realize that not only did I live in a simulated society, but my identity wasn't just this body, that I was a social being, that whoever I was wasn't in a vacuum, that you know, my identity as a person had to do with my family, my friends, the people around me. And I really started thinking a lot about social design pathways, what I can do as an individual to affect change, the connections and bonds that I can make with the people around me, to transform systems and forms that are invisible to us, that don't have names. It's amazing, it's why we have critique in, in, in our classes. We don't, know what to, we don't know how to talk about it, we don't know how we feel, because we're in these bodies that kind of are, are inside of us, but also outside of us, so we're kind of in the environment, but not really in the environment, and I think we're always making sense of multiple things at the same time. So I started deploying more complex strategies for my viewers. Again, there was no right answer. All you had to do was pay attention and immediately something would happen in your imagination. You've all heard that saying, art is in the eye of the beholder. I think that's one of the biggest kind of misquotes in like recent art history. I think it's partially true. I think art does exist in the eye of the beholder, but only partially. The other part exists in the world. And your job as artist is to connect your eye with the part of the world that sets that part of the world free as much as you're set free by it. Dierdre Dierdrichsen, a wonderful German philosopher, talks about the surplus value of art not being what you intend your art to mean, but the potential it has to transform meaning around it. Right? So this is actually when I started thinking about, well, how do I make art with the space in the room? Right? Installation, at this point, uh, was really something that I was interested in. I'd always really wanted to be an engineer and an architect, but I didn't have anybody in my family who was an engineer and an architect. So I can only look at the pictures of those bridges and those buildings in encyclopedias, right? So again, just because you don't think you can right now doesn't mean your work won't get it out of you, right? So here, actually, I, I, I gotta say, uh, I made a, a, a rolling uh, print of a fence. So if you can imagine those really long poles that you paint walls with, uh, I basically figured out how to take lino linoleum and easy cut, transfer a fence image onto it, and then stick it on the roller so that I can so that I can make uh, giant fences very quickly. Uh, kind of first as graffiti, but then at the end, it ended up coming into the gallery walls. Um, Thank you so much. I need that earlier. Um, so what you're looking at is the wall is actually stamped, roll stamped with uh, chalkboard paint. So it has a very kind of opaque, heavy, physical matter that it carries. Uh, so you, you actually feel like you're in a fence. It's, it's, it's really odd. Um, and then the, the piece that you're looking below is a really long coffin size uh, painting of a monochrome. 
but yes. it's 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 that chroma key green that they use in Hollywood to kind of replace things, right? So that's just really t- supposed to be like a placeholder, but it's so thick that you can't ignore it. So there's this cognitive dissonance that your eyes start having, and then what, you, you, what you're looking ab- above there are each like a 12 by 12 encaustic panel uh, embedded with uh, Crayola color crayons. So like immediately people just want to touch and smell and just be up to the paintings. It's in my, like, it, I feel bad for the people that work at the gallery because they're constantly telling people, please don't scratch the art, don't touch it. But I really wanted to go back to that notion of what makes us, right? And on this end, it's, it's, there's these different senses that you can use when you're looking at art. So the encaustic paint, how many of you all have been working with encaustic paint yet? Just show of hands. It's this really great ancient Egyptian technique. It's one of the earliest forms of kind of medium held painting where pigment was put into wax. Uh, and people would have their death portraits painted on their wood coffins. And we still, you could, they're, they're actually, they last forever. So these paintings, they outlast almost everything around it. Um, but the paraffin color crayons actually are really cheap and they have a really low melting point. So I was really thinking about how do I craft a process for taking this ancient pharaoh technique for portraiture and like mix it with like Mattel culture, like TV culture? So again, how do I take this very uncultured United States with this very ancient regal culture of Egypt? And so there's a lot of aesthetics that I'm mixing in my work that you might not know it unless you're a fan of art. Right? It is that in the end, I think if, if you do want to go into a life of making a living as an artist, be a fan of art. Be a fan of artists. Make friends with artists. Because uh, that's really how you make a living in the art world. Uh, there's, there's nepotism and plagiarism. And if you're in school, plagiarism gets you kicked out. But if you're in the art world, plagiarism makes you a living. Uh, it's funny, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so if you don't have any ideas, start stealing them. To quote Picasso, don't just borrow them, make them yours, right? I would say go further, be ethical, and give credit where credit is due, right? It's okay. It's, it, culture is made to exchange. Um, and so for me, the work that I'm making isn't just a way to tell a story about a pain or an obstacle that I've overcome but really just to revel in the pure joy of being a human, of having senses, of having fun. I mean, color is just fun. It doesn't have to, you know, I mean, these colors were designed to color in some other image, but for me, it's like, I just like them like they are. Um, and you can make up your own rules when you're an artist, right? So uh, when somebody says, hey, you can't steal my idea, you're like, well, you can't stop art, right? I, you know, you inspired me so much. Now I gotta tell people about you too, right? And Nepotism, you all know what nepotism means, right? Where you only give pe- people in your family a job? That's the art world. That's the design world. If you really want to work in the design in the art world, get family in the art and design world. Show up to openings. Meet people. Don't ask them for something the first time you meet them. Feed them first. Take them out to coffee. <laughs> then ask for something. Like, come to my studio and give me feedback about this mistake I made last week. I don't know what to do moving forward, right? Being an artist isn't inclusive of just the objects we make it's a lifestyle it's a quality of life y'all and i think it's i was telling the faculty earlier that i feel embarrassed how like satiated i feel how happy i feel what a quality of life i'm privileged to have i get to live my values intentionally so i know when i need to make a compromise i know when i need to collaborate i know when i need to cooperate and i'm always moving Right? I feel like water. I'm always finding my level, my balance. Right? And that's what an art and design education gives you. It gives you a way to be free. It gives you a way to own your mistakes and be responsible for your choices. I mean, that's the vision of our country, to be responsible for our own choices. Why aren't more of us artists? So I just took a Michelangelo Alhirsti book and painted over it and called it my art. Right, and I I mean, I paid a lot of money for the frames. That convinces people, right? Really nice frames convince people that what's ever in them is art. So when you make something really beautiful, put a really nice frame on it. It'll just augment that beauty that's already inside of them. Don't put that IKEA frame on them. And I'll tell people that it's from IKEA. You're not from IKEA. You're from Vancouver. 
So this is, again, for me, the power of not just image, but context. And I don't know how many of you all are a fan of photography, uh, but I am. Before, I was not a fan of photography. Uh, I hated photography because it replaced painting, my first love. Um, uh, so this is actually a, a redacted image of the interior of the Sistine Chapel by Michelangelo. How many already of you know of Michelangelo? Okay. So, you know, big guns. You don't mess with Michelangelo. Right? You can mess with a lot of people, but there's like a whole school that came after Michelangelo. We're like, we don't even know what to do after Michelangelo. We're the mannerists, right? We, we paint in the manner of Michelangelo. And I think that's one of the struggles that I've always had as an artist. Is I'm such a fan of all the amazing creative people around me. It's difficult not to be in, like infected and infested with their ideas. I mean, I can't, my, my excuse is, I can't help but steal from you. You have really good ideas, right? You, you make really beautiful things. I want to have good ideas. I want to make beautiful things. And you can't stop me, right? I can see how to do it without you even teaching me, right? So in many ways, art gave me a way to learn even though I wasn't a normative thinker. You know, I struggled with dyslexia. I struggled with English being a second language. Hell, I even struggled with Spanish as my first language, right? So communication was hard. I didn't like people. I didn't like to talk. Public speaking is my greatest fear, but I do it because it really means that I get to kind of share my struggle so you can skip over it, right? But again, I think for me, it doesn't matter how much I get rid of the image. If you can read, you can see something different, right? And for me, I started kind of taking opposites that I had played against each other at this point. So photography versus painting in this piece is photography and painting make something together. So I didn't take the picture, some other person took the picture, you know, and, and, and I'm trying to give credit to the work that I'm doing to the past so that hopefully I can also connect with the future. And I think, again, that thing that I'm talking to you about in terms of nepotism and plagiarism, when you copy other artists and you master their techniques, you kind of feel like they're in your family. You kind of feel like you're in their family. You can, you, every time you look at their work, you understand it a little better, right? So it's not enough just to know paintings and art and printmaking and design just by looking at it. Try your hand at it. Because I tell you what, even if you're not going to go into an art career, it'll let you know when whatever you're doing needs to change because it's not working. And I would say in my young life, I've seen whole industries come and go. Right? My family has, has daily been replaced by automation in the fields. I mean, it's tough work anyways, working in the fields and the canneries, but you know, they're automating it. I mean, in the future, we need people to program robots. That's you all, artists, right? You know how to be human. Robots don't know how to be human, you do, right? And I think what's integral to being human is the ability to adapt and change. And if you can't adapt and change, I don't know how you can get a job or have a career, let alone be an artist or designer. Um, so at some point, I'd gotten all, you know, to a point where I'd paint myself into a corner. Uh, being an artist of color in the Northwest, it's, it's pretty lonely. There's not actually many of us, uh, if, if any. Uh, and usually nobody notices uh, when only the same 25 people show up. So the art world and the design world are the most racist, sexist places in the world. We tell each other why we exclude each other. You're not good enough. There's somebody better than you right there, right? And we, and, and, and we show each other how much better we are, right? So at this point in my art career, it was so exhausting to constantly be trying to explain, you know, the difficulty of making the Northwest your home when you don't feel like you're welcome. Uh, the difficulty of navigating the uncertainty of an art career, teaching, trying to be a parent, get married to another artist that, by the way, has their own narcissism to deal with and their own kind of self-centeredness, right? Uh, but despite that, I think we go back to this craft that the reason why we teach you so many different forms of art is so that you can change. Right? So really, when you go into your classes, think about each medium offering you a different form of thought to explore. Right? Because when you make something out of clay, it's going to feel different in your hands than when you're pushing around zinc or ink or making a photograph or using an iPhone to make a camera or, or a, a, a photograph. Right? So um, at this point, I didn't want to make art anymore. I didn't want to be in the art world. It was too tough. 
I'd gotten my MFA, I got my BFA, I was teaching. Uh, you know, half of my paycheck went to my student loans, the other half went to uh, my landlord. Thank goodness people were still buying things that looked like art at this point, because that's really what kept us going, right? So, you know, an art and design education is a really great way to think about, like, you know, when, when the big company can't hire me, when, when, when the big school can't hire me, when, when nobody's hiring, what do I do? Well, you make up your own industry and you hire yourself as the boss, first of all, right? And I think that's really one of the things that I didn't realize an art education would get me. Um, but to be a boss, you have to delegate work, right? You tell other people what to do. So at this point, this is back uh, now five years ago, because I can tell because my children are a lot smaller in this picture than, I stay looking the same, but my children get older. Um, I didn't take this picture, uh, but it's mine. Uh, everything else you'd seen in that you know, up to the Michelangelo's pages, like I, I really needed to make, I needed to be in full control of. But at this point, I really, I took a leap and I said, you know, I have enough faith in my skills as a traditional modernist, you know, artist rooted in my values that I can make a shift. And instead of being radical and rooted and fixed like the modern kind of precursors of the uh, American art that I learned and, and, and kind of driven by ideology like the traditional artist of the Renaissance. Basically all the art up to the Renaissance y'all is about faith. It's about imagining God, about imagining our faith in God, in, in a being greater than us, in a universe, in the stars. You know before we could chart the stars we imagined them, right? So again don't let art history like get the best of you. There's, it's not that different. Things don't change that much. They, we just call it different things. Right? We steal each other's ideas and then we give them new names, right? So for me, I, I wanted to really kind of just let go of all that. And I started letting go of making art. It was the hardest thing I had to learn how to do as an artist, is not make the work. Um, and thankfully I was teaching, so teaching itself is also an art, so hopefully we have educators, uh, future educators in the room, because we need you, right? We're, we, we're living in a time where I mean, look at you. You are the exceptional people in our community who are taking time out of their Wednesday night to talk, like, hear from an artist you've... I've never even seen you at my opening, so I don't... You, I know this is probably the first time you've seen my art, but here you are. And that spirit, I think, is we, what we need more of in our society, right? And so I'm encouraging you all to think about teaching, because, again, it's your ability to tell this story over and over again that's going to impact our society in, in, in a positive way. So for me, this was an opportunity to make art in weird Portland. I think Portlandia had just started, and so there was this kind of, the whole city became an art project. You didn't know when you might see a film crew around the corner. Uh, hipsters were more hipster than I'd ever seen them. Our, our pants got tired. Our, we lost all the gears of our bikes. Uh, you know, it, it just, I, 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 the absurdity wouldn't stop, and I, I wanted to play into that. And, and, and I also wanted to play into how invisible that was making a lot of us in the room that were already being called weird for, for different reasons, right? As, as, as a kind of uh, a slur, all weirdo, right? And, and coming from the Bay Area to where I'm to school, being a weirdo wasn't a good thing, right? So moving to Portland, I'm like, oh, I want to live in a city full of weirdos. Uh, but our progressive values were shifting at this point. You know, I moved to Portland because it was slow. Nobody knew about it. I could afford to live here without 12 roommates. Um, last year we had to buy a house just to get out of, out of the rental market, right? The city is squeezing people out, all of us, right? And it's, it's, and it's what cities do, right? And, and I think as an artist, instead of fighting it and hating it, I just let my practice be the record, the archive of that transition. Um, it was a way for me to have fun too. So the this, I love this image. Uh, this image is, not this one, but, but, but images like it are actually in museums. Um, and and uh, this one was actually taken by the morning waitress at Doug Fur. You know, and it's amazing to me because it's especially today, people who don't think of themselves as artists, I gotta say, no, no offense to people that think of themselves as artists, but the people who aren't sure if they're artists or know that they're not artists, they're actually the people making the art. Everybody else is just doing it like it used to happen, right? And, and so for me, I think this was a way to kind of take that nurturing creativity of a studio practice into the public sphere where, you know, I didn't know if people would take 
my picture as Mad Max. By the way, my, my alter ego's name is Mad Max. That's not really, the mask actually represents Blue Demon, but I find that most people in the Northwest don't know much about Lucha and don't follow it. So they don't, they're not gonna know that that's Blue Demon, so I can call it whatever I want. So I called it Mad Max. Uh, and so Mad Max comes out uh, when, when I'm, I'm the minority in the room. Um, and I asked the waitress, you know, would you take my picture? And she said, sure, no problem. And she took an amazing picture. And so I, I tried to figure out like, okay, how, like, how much can I do this? And it started off a social media uh, project. I'm sorry, the mic is going in and out. Um, but it's amazing. I, I always go home and, and I don't know what the pictures are going to look like until I get the, my, my phone back. I've always gotten my phone back, by the way. Nobody's ever said no to taking one of these pictures. It's kind of scary because especially after there's been some kind of public violence or something, I, I have to be really mindful of when I take my mask off, right? Because when people hide their faces, sometimes it's very scary, right? And, and so there's a lot of quick kind of not just context creation, but consent. So I still haven't let go of that. So you can't tell that what I've made is consent and context. Right? It just looks like a photograph. Uh, but there was a lot of things that happened up to that. Um, and again, I, I, I was talking to uh, the faculty about, you know, we used to ask what art is. But I, I find that, you know, I teach at the Pacific North College of Art over in Portland. Come visit me whenever you want a tour. Uh, get me out of a meeting, please. Um, uh, we used to ask what is art, but now I find myself asking, who's the artist? What's an artist, right? I mean, I don't, I mean, if I know who the artist is or, or what the artist is, I'll tell you what the art is. It's, that's, not, that's not a surprise. It kind of looks like it used to look, but a little different, right? And, and I think I'm looking for, as a curator, as a teacher, as a philosopher, as an art scholar, as, as, as a philosopher of aesthetics, I need you to make your work because the old forms of art and design are not working. Uh, for how much enlightenment and rebirth and renaissance we've had in the last 500 years, barbarism seems to be taking a rise in our society. And we're a young society. It's to be expected. But you need to be doing this work because it's in you that the future of art and design exist. In you is the future work that will be featured in the Whitney Biennial. In the next incarnation of a West Coast Biennial, right? It's not in me, it's not in me, it's in you, right? And so I want you to take your work seriously and don't settle for making things that look like art, but really push to asking better questions. And, and honestly, I feel like if, we, if we're right and we live in the dark ages, the most radical thing you can do isn't show me something that I've already seen, is let me see the world through your own eyes so that I can ask better questions about the world, right? Again, we're so, we're so free, we're separated from each other, and I find that there's few platforms like art or design that can bring us together. And that might sound hyperbolic, right? That might sound like I'm just kind of saying big, big ideas, but it isn't. I mean, we live in a world of total design. The chair you sit in, the clothes you wear, the choices you've made about the apparel on your body, on your shoes, uh, all these aesthetic functions of society, relaying messages about where you are today in life, where you sit in this room, has already been kind of mathematically preconditioned by the architects and planners who thought about this place without ever even meeting us. Right? So we already live in total art and total design. Right? So it's, it, think about what avenues you need to navigate. I'm bringing this image up and it's hilarious that it's getting cropped right where the punctum of the piece is. So this is one of the very early pieces that I did when I was trying on this alter ego persona of a wrestler. And, and of course, as you do when you're a mythical, metaphysical, conceptual luchador, you try on different masks. So I spent, as any good artist would, you know, with a good like half year, year of material exploration where I was just trying different things on. You wouldn't realize it, but not all heads are suited for all masks. I didn't know that until I tried about 25 masks on, that there's some that just, you wouldn't think, you didn't think that, you know, your head was as like unique as you are. Um, and, and this is actually Santos's max. 
mask that never really quite fit. My nose and my mouth were just the wrong separation and my eyes looked googly out of it. It was too scary for the children. Uh, my children had a hard time with this project. Uh, and, and, uh, but it made for really kind of extraordinary pictures. So actually, my wife took this picture. Uh, it's at Skimania Lodge. I don't know if you've all been, I mean, I, I love the Northwest. It's the most beautiful place, I, I think, in the world. Uh, it, it, when I look at the gorge, when I look at, at the landscape around here, I can see time, right? I, I can be in one of the classrooms at PNCA, because we have these towers now, and I, I swear I can look where you are right now, and I can see Mount St. Helens. I feel so close, right? It's like growing up in the Central Valley of California, you just didn't get those views. Everything was flat. You didn't see anything, right? So just even looking for me is like, that's it. There's nothing else. So. For me, this, this, was, this piece was really getting about this kind of design world, this design object, the simulation you and I share that we call life, right? Uh, I think besides a little bit of hair that you can see in my back, I mean, I'm telling you this is me, right? You can't see my face, you know, but I'm sure I'm a sincere guy, right, right Grant? I mean, you know, I wouldn't lie to you, but of course I'm lying to you. Uh, you don't know that that's me. There's just a lot of trust that we give to art so immediately powerful. So I would encourage you not to abuse that power. Right? Use your power with that trust to look. Use it to empower people. Use it to practice not oppressing people. Use it to practice staying free. Right? And I think in, in, in my short life as an artist, I think I, run, you know, I thought I was going to make murals against governments and states like a Mexican muralist. You know, I thought I was going to get away from the figure like abstract expressionist and minimalist. But lo and behold, I keep coming back to us and our story and how we tell it. And frankly, it's not my job to tell your story. It's not my job to represent you. I'm not a government. And neither are you. You can speak for yourself. Right? And it takes many forms. It can be a poem. It can be a picture. It can be an Instagram feed. Victor Maldonado daily practice. I follow for follow, right? Because I love to see your art as much as you love to see mine, right? As artists, not only do we give each other permission to look at us, right? I think it gives us permission to look at the world in a way that we wouldn't if we weren't artists, right? Because I don't, I don't, I don't remember a time before I was an artist, but there's a lot of people around me who don't ever feel like they. Like they can look at the world around them, right? Most of the people that aren't artists right now that I know are kind of doing this. Like they don't want to look, right? They, they don't want to have any kind of connection to the present moment because for a lot of them it's painful. For a lot of them it's confusing. For some of them, they don't even just know. They're just, they're just busy doing something else, right? Um, and and I, I would encourage you to really practice that kind of deeper looking into the world. I, I, I have a sense that's where the art is going to be. In this piece, uh, as you kind of move away from the clouds and the gorge and you make your way to the landscape, you begin to notice how manicured, oh, some, I mean, my intention was to have you all notice how manicured the landscape was, to the point where if you spend more than five minutes with this piece, you realize that what you're looking at is a golf course. And then if you look a little bit further into the margin of the picture where you, people usually don't look, because people usually look for the big thing in the middle, so that's why I give them the head, right? Um, and on the sides of the margins, there's these really wealthy people playing golf, having the time of their life, right? I love golf, by the way, don't, so don't think that I'm against them, but there's this thing of like, part of why we keep making images is because looking is really like difficult. It's almost impossible for many people. The reason we make things is because the things we make, make us as well. I, I, honestly, I think that's why ceramics is so amazing. I mean, I don't, we were talking about this, like some, you know, what we love about ceramics is you can go into the ceramics studio without an idea because clay is already the most beautiful idea that you can have. It does all these amazing things. When it's wet, it takes shapes like water does. It does that, 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 that viscous thing that gets goopy, but also gets water. You can, you can squirt it out of things. You can put it under a 3D printer, right? And then you can put it through a lot of kind of dry hell. You can dry it out. You can stick it in, 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 in heat, right? It can take a lot of pressure. Right? I love that. I mean, it's, it's always encouraging to see how much I can beat up my art materials and they make such beautiful things. 
And I think that's kind of a metaphor for what we do. We go through so much as human beings, oftentimes if we don't have a creative practice, if you don't have a daily practice, if you're not a Sunday anything, you don't have anywhere to put all those thoughts, feelings that the world really can't with, right? Because I, I know, you know, there's, there's parts of us that we don't understand, there's parts of the world we don't understand, and that's the perfect content to put into art, right? Because then we can talk about it. Then we can think about it together. Uh, and ask different questions, right? Um, this, this is one of the, I see, I see people laughing, thank you. Uh, a sense of humor is something I've had to learn, y'all. I am such a sincere, non-ironic person. Like this, tw this last 10, 20 years have been really hard on me because I don't know when people are like joking or not, if they're being mean or if they're really funny. A lot of people I know are really funny by being mean. So again, I, this is me learning how to be content for my work, how to be the subject matter, right? Art's really good at like painting like beautiful naked white women or beautiful black women or exotic bodies, right? Or exotic landscapes or still lives, right? But what does, it become, what does it mean when we as artists become the subject of our own work? I think that's a lot of the condition that I find a lot of us in. So I would encourage all of you, before you make anything, make yourselves. And then you can make art. Does that make sense? I don't know if it's a lesson that you will... Okay, you're, you're not enough, so it's not making sense. All right. So before you can make art, you have to make yourself an artist. So that means you have to live your own values. Before you make art, you have to make your values. If you don't have values, make your values. That's a great thing to use like school for. I don't know, I mean, that's kind of where I kind of authored my values, by learning about the values of the past, of the society I lived in presently, and making my own choices, right? But again, that's, not, I, that's something I, I didn't hear in art school, so I want to share it with you, is like, once you believe you're an artist, once you believe you're having the daily practices, the weekly, monthly, seasonal, and yearly, experiences that you seek, then you can make art, right? It's not just taking one art class and deciding that I'm not very good at that. Honestly, if you're not very good at it, chances are you can probably make art with it, right? It's very counterintuitive. Learn about the past and don't do that. That's art, by the way, and that's really valuable contemporary art. If you cannot do what we did in the past, it's contemporary art. Um, and if you can question it, it's very valuable art, right? Uh, and if you can make fun of yourself, like I'm learning to do, then you can really take it farther than you can think you can go. Um, I might look out of place, actually, but this is a, a place that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, I think both this picture and that last picture are on the coast of Nesco, and I, I never feel like more like an outsider than when I'm in Nescoin because it's this really intentional village on the coast that's really exclusive. It's really like, like, like irresponsible how expensive houses on, on the Oregon beach are. Like, you know, like we all have access to them, but I was really thinking about like how we love to take up space, right? And so I plop myself just right in the middle of a thoroughway on a busy kind of weekend on the coast where people just want to get away from their city life and they don't want to deal with a conceptual artist, right? So I'm bringing this up because sometimes in your life, you know, you will expose your work to people that don't want to see it uh, and you will see things you don't want to see, right? But still we have to be together and uh, again, it helped that there was young children who weren't afraid around me doing this. But again, nobody said no to taking the picture. And as you can tell, I think even though I thought I let go of images and content about the story of my life, I think because I started realizing that I wasn't alone, that my immigrant experience was very similar to millions of immigrants. Um, I wanted to build solidarity with them. I, I, I wanted my work to be, be a, like a signal, be like, hey, you're not alone. I might not know you. I might not be able to like, hang out with you in person, but I, I see you. I get you. Right, you're you're a luchador too, right? So this is actually uh, I'm an artist that uses photography, but I wouldn't necessarily. I don't think my photography colleagues at PNC would call me a photographer. I think they would call me an anti-photographer. So actually, all all of these images, all these photographs that you're looking at, were just on whatever iPhone was out that moment. It's incredible, like what technology and power we have at our fingertips, and um, it made it possible for me to make random people 
co-collaborators into my work, right? Like, here, you take the picture now, right? Um, and here, uh, you know, I, I, I went back to making the image myself. But again, this is, um, this is the flag uh, hanging at White and Kennedy. But I was thinking, this is as I'm, I'm becoming a citizen. I'm, I was put through this really rigorous process. I'd live here, you know, I migrated here when I was 40 days old. Uh, you know, we migrated every other year. But basically from the time that I was a freshman in high school, you know, I didn't go back to Mexico for like 10 years, right? I, I, I wasn't, I was born there, but I'm not really from Mexico. And as a, as a, as a legal resident, I never really felt American either. Um, and I, th I think when I became a citizen, I didn't realize how much I would really kind of love America more, love being a citizen more. Uh, going through that process, reading all the founding documents. It was such a unique, exquisite civics education, right? I, I, this is like before, I think this is uh, before, right, right after Obama's second election. Uh, I, I wanted to become a citizen and, and vote in that election, but I couldn't. So I kind of, I got to vote in the midterms after that. But I didn't realize how much of a fan I am of the United States, of a lot of the original amazing ideas that the founders of the United States had. Exquisite anti-fundamentalist texts. It's amazing. I mean, how many of you all have read through all the foundational documents in the United States? I mean, you should. It's incredible. It's so plainly written. I mean, you can read it. But it's not something you read uh, like a biblical text, right? It's, it's not meant to be fixed or fundamentalist. So it's really poetic. Um, I read a lot of policy and procedure, and, and I read actually a lot of laws. And I gotta say, our, our current lawmakers might learn something from our, our founding fathers because there's a real poesis in the Declaration of Independence, in the Constitution, in the Bill of Rights, uh, in a lot of, and I would also encourage you to look at the documents that were the first and second drafts on themselves before uh, the, the, they went into the Constitution. Because uh, again, I think we, we forget that our founding fathers were artists and poets, and what they were doing was imagining a space the size of the United States, but really the size of each of our brains and hearts. It's incredible, and I think when you read the original text, when you actually look at the laws that govern you, they don't have power over you in the way that you think they might. Same thing with art and design. Just look at the thing, learn about it, it looks hard because you haven't done that yet, right? But when you do the demo, when you make your first couple of mistakes, when you write your first draft, you can get to this bigger idea, right? And again, I, I would encourage you to think not just about art in isolation. I think one of the biggest kind of travesties of our educational system is that we've divorced art from all the other parts of our learning. And I gotta say, I don't know a scientist that doesn't need an artist or designer. Because how are you going to show me the mitochondria? Like, how are you going to show me, like, the moon without a photographer, without a designer to do the layout for your book, uh, for your presentation, right? So don't just think of your education in art being about making things for the art world. Because I think, again, your creativity, imagination, we need in civics, we need in medicine, we need in education, in business. I would say most of my students who get a BFA and an MFA end up being directors at organizations that need people who can adapt and change their mind, who know how to not do the thing that doesn't work over and over again. Uh, if you can practice taking good advice, uh, people want to hire you, right? So again, I think don't, don't just focus on your jobs, but think about your career. Think about the obstacles that you overcome to get to your education at, at Clark College. All right, maybe you didn't plan for those obstacles, right? Maybe it's the obstacles that lie through your way. So now as scholars, as students, as future student, as uh, educators, choose the obstacles you want to overcome. I mean, that's the difference. I think that's the value of art school is now you have the power to choose what obstacles do you overcome. Do you want to work in an in industry where they don't hire people like you? Do you want to change people's minds about current affairs? Right? Think about that. It, it should matter to you, right? Because you, you can always come back and do art. You know, we, it's not even a real thing. We have to invent it every time, right? So don't let it hold you back. 
Uh, does that make sense, y'all? Because I think one of the things I struggled with when I was at your point of view is I had no idea how an art education applied uh, to everyday life. Um, and I got to say, I, I, first I got to check on time because I know I got asked to cut it short. I, I've gone over, I realize. But um, I was say I didn't realize how not only was my art education something, a valuable part of my education, but it was how I would continue learning after school. And, and I think that's something that, uh, I, again, I can't, I can't tell the future, but I, I have a sense it's gonna look something like the past. Um, and you all will have to probably adapt another or two other times to buy your house, uh, you know, feed yourself, and, and if you're lucky, uh, or if you, if you choose to, uh, a family, right? I mean, you're, you're nurturing, right? So think about the obstacles you overcome and then make a list of the obstacles you want to overcome. Getting your associate's degree, that's a good obstacle to write down and you should put it at the top, top of your resume when you do, right? That's why you put those things in your resume because that not everybody gets an associate's degree, not everybody gets a master's, not everybody gets a master's. That's why we go to school, right? So do you see what I'm talking about? Just by making yourself be able to get here and get an education, you're already an artist. You're already a designer. You got to start focusing on the quality of life that you want to lead so that you can start thinking about, okay, everybody says being a millionaire is great, but do I really need a million dollars to live the quality of life that I, that I seek? Okay, yeah. Most, most, most of us do need a million dollars to live a comfortable lifestyle. And you know what millionaires do? is they don't spend all their time worrying about spending money and spending their money, right? Which is one of the things I'm practicing doing as an artist is not spending all my time being anxious about where will I eat, where will I live, who will I meet, you know, will I be welcome, right? So again, there's a lot that you're navigating just to succeed as students here. And I would say, I would encourage you to draw from that and put it in, in, in your work because it, th then it will become something maybe that you won't sell to others but that you can look at and learn from and grow from when you open your first business um, and you can point to that work of art that you did in at clark college and be like you know i didn't know that i could do that and there's this weird artist that came to talk when you know wednesday night and said think about the obstacles you want to overcome and go after them intentionally and now i have 500 employees and they can retire right I, I, again the future of art is in you and in the United States, our art is being human with each other. So I hope you're getting a good education here. And I hope that you are thinking about art school. And if you are thinking about art school, I want to help you apply. I'm not an admissions counselor. I didn't have anybody to help me apply, but I still got in. Uh, if you have questions about what it's actually like to be a, a you know, living, working artist, I'm more than happy to to have coffee and talk about that. I'll, I'll hang out with you at PNC and show you around what an art school looks like. It's just one of many. Um, and, and, and I'd love to talk to you about what's the right fit for you, right? Clark, Clark College is the right fit for you now, but what's the, next, what's the next right fit for you? Is it college? Is it, is it a job? Or is it actually getting a career, just straight up inventing your own industry? Uh, and how can you fold uh, this experience into that? Does that make sense? I'm really open to you all uh, reaching out. Uh, I'm in the art world, so if you go to First Thursday openings, if you visit PNCA, I'm easily accessible. Uh, you can connect to me through your instructors. Um, come to my openings, say hi. Uh, I have a show at Froelich Gallery in the fall, in, in September. So if you are in downtown or in the Pearl in Portland next September, I'm gonna have a solo show. Um, I think I'm going to show giant lucha masks that you can walk into and take Instagram photos in and out of. Uh, but, I mean, that's, that's my intention. So please come back and see if I've done it. Does anybody have any questions? I know it's late. Yeah. Do you think that it's possible to show your work and decide how it works? That, uh, getting the confidence to show and call work my own uh, took a lot of work. But again, I think, you know, growing up, Mexican migrant had a lot of obstacles, but one of, was, one of them wasn't a lack of encouragement in terms of, of, of doing things that you can't do. Um, There's a story that my great-grandmothers and grandmothers would tell the young men and women, uh, kind of, 
coming to the United States and they didn't know if they were going to make it crossing the border and and uh, the story of the revolution where the village was kind of fighting back against the um, the landowner uh, and he was so worried that um, the villagers were going to take all his his money that he got his prized bull and had this enchanted spell where the stomach was cut open and replaced with the money and then set into the wild. And the story is when you're walking around my village in Changuitiro uh, and you hear and you turn around and you see a bull, when it hits you, if you face it with courage, it will turn to gold. But if you turn and face the bull with fear, it'll turn to not gold, it'll turn to manure, right? Uh, and I think as, as an artist, when you're making work, presenting it to a larger audience, there's always that fear of, will my work be accepted, right? But because I've already practiced facing my fears with courage, it turns to gold, right? So honestly, y'all, I the first gallery I got, I didn't know how to ask for gallery representation. I didn't know the social mores or anything. I just really connected with somebody who was in Portland, Charles. I, I thought he was a great cook, a great gardener, and I liked the art that he was showing. And I said, uh, will you represent me? And like, you know, a couple days later, he's like, yeah, look at your work. You're welcome, we'll get your show, right? So I almost feel like I'm such in the practice of being kind of encouraged to face my fears that if I'm afraid of it, I'll do it, right? So then I figure out, okay, why was I so afraid to do that? Um, but I would say start small, right? And if you are interested in having a life as a selling artist, it's better that you start pricing your things low to sell them to make an income, pay yourself back the money that, that you use to make the work, but make sure that you're putting your work in, in the right living room, in the right hands, right? Because inevitably, if, if you're not selling your work that expensive, you still want people to value it. So you find people in your community that value it. So then when people come over, they're like, where did you get that amazing painting? You're like, oh, I got it from this amazing artist that I met at Clark College. How much did it cost? Oh, I want one too, right? It's accessible to them, right? And that's actually how most art careers happen, is you sell your work to the right people at the right price, and they have the right friends that are connected to the right galleries and museums and writers and editors in the art world, and they want what you have. But I think it begins with you understanding that you're, I mean, I tell my students at this point, you know, when they're, when they're in their second year, you should be charging $20 an hour for your creative labor, right? And so, again, uh, it's taken, sometimes it takes me, you know, 16 years to learn a craft. It, you know, I can make a drawing in an hour that I can sell, but it took me 20 years to learn how to draw that well, right? So I charge a lot more per hour, right? I ask my graduate students to really think about their minimum hourly bit, like wage at $50. Right. I, I would also encourage you all to ask people what their budget is before anything, right? And I, I think it's, it's, it's not being afraid to know what you're worth, how much you invested in it, and to ask for it. That's it. And it, it, but it is. I, I think talk to your instructors about kind of their approaches too, because there's not one right size. Uh, and sometimes people are, are, are really kind of absurd when they buy things. They'll just spend like a lot of money just because they have it. Um, and so sometimes it's not just don't make the mistake of going into a place and being like, what's the work that I could make for you that will sell? Right? I think in, inevitably that's not the right fit for most people. I think, I think what sells is things that you care deeply about. So if you care deeply about it, you establish cult value. And if you care deeply about it and that thing you make has cult value, then you can talk about it. You can share it. You can hand it off to people. Look what I made. Come look at it. Then there's exchange value. And, and in our society, you can't have market value unless you have cult and exchange value, right? You, so you have to care a lot about what you're making and you have to have people that you can hand it off to, right? And, and that takes networking. That takes doing your research and walking around galleries and different venues and knowing what's feasible.